in the software development space, we talk about the stack a lot. And the tech stack are all the layers of your application from the bare metal server, if you want to consider that level, all the way up to the front end. For organizations to be successful, they not only need to think about what's in their tech stack, they need to think about their monitoring stack as well. So at each layer of their tech stack, do they have a monitoring tool that is going to give them the necessary visibility such that at the end of the day, they have full stack visibility. Some organizations are really good at creating monitoring for one layer. But really, if you're going to be successful and maintain application velocity, you need to have full stack monitoring and full stack visibility. And a big part of that, and this is not a new term, but it's certainly becoming more interesting, is digital experience monitoring. And Dave is going to tell us all about digital experience monitoring. So yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about digital experience monitoring. Digital experience monitoring, as, as Chris just laid out for us very honestly, is sort of the new hot buzzword that's showing up inside of uh, the space. And in fact, we even can see that one of the um, sometimes trailers in technology, uh, Gardner, is actually pointing out that this is one of the major places that, that we need to really see that infrastructure and operations are going to have to get involved in. So what this is, very honestly, is how we move between where the user experience starts and where the user experience ends. Um, honestly, monitoring is all around the user. If, if nobody cares that the system's broken, nobody cares. So it's only when we come back and we can have unhappy users or users that aren't capable of getting the right sets of information that we start really looking at this. And because of this, this digital transformation, people no longer have complete control over the data pathways. We have ephemeral uh, functionality. We have elastic functionalities. We have serverless capabilities. As we move to clouds, as we continue with hybrid, we're losing, we're, we're beginning to lose control of who does what. Um, one of my favorite lines about monitoring was back in the old days, the reason that we put flashing lights on servers was so that we could see that the server was actually running. Didn't mean the server was performant, just simply meant the server was running. And we're now moving past that because not only do we not own the server, we don't see the server and the server definitely doesn't have flashing lights on it. So the user path is really what, what drives all these things here. And the pathway that a user takes can be drastically different about how they go into to things here. If you're sitting at your local Starbucks or sitting on a public internet, you've got a public Wi-Fi, you probably have set up a VPN, hopefully, inside of that. You're gonna hit a load balancer. You're gonna hit firewalls. There's more and more stuff that's involved inside of this. Sooner or later, you're probably gonna cross cloud boundaries at some point. You may cross cloud boundaries back out to the backend stuff, but the backend stuff might be in, inside the cloud itself. Public Wi-Fi's are notorious for being overloadable. Um, and so you may see slowness there. Uh, firewalls may be limited inside of here. Offices have usually better Wi-Fi or direct connections in here. They also can be got in, into via VPN set. And then the same sets of functionality. And then we hit the mobile environment, 4G, LTE, 5G coming. And now you've got cell transmissions inside of this. And this can change. If you're driving, you're gonna hit a new cell tower. Every minute or so, you're probably gonna pick up a new cell uh, inside of here. Then you're gonna get back into your load balancers, clouds, clouds, um, and the back end functionality. And finally, if you're like me sitting at home, home Wi-Fi is very wildly. Um, during our summer, before the students went back to school, my home Wi-Fi was sufficient. Now with all the kids also doing home studies, my neighborhood quite often drops to where nobody is performant on their, their internets from that model. And so, we have different user pathways. We no longer can go look and see if the flashing lights are working for that. But when we start looking at this, DIM actually covers a lot of categories. And these are just the, the, what are considered the five major ones. And we'll drill into a couple of these for a little bit here. 
but we can say endpoint monitoring is one of these or the end-to-end -end user monitoring functionality. What device are they coming from? How are they getting to us uh, from that device? And how are we talking to them? We can then, this is um, actually heavily driven now, far more so because of our mobile environments, but also because we're now getting more IoT devices that are coming into play here. Monitoring specific endpoint is very important here. We look at network path analysis. Where did we hop? How long did each hop take? And is hops themselves optimal inside of here? Synthetic application testing, we'll deal into a little bit more here. Starts looking at things like HTTP monitoring. How do we know the web is up? How do we know the web is performant? Synthetic transactions, testing capabilities to make sure that our applications are working efficiently as well. We can go into traffic analysis, looking at what the packets contain and how the packets are being funneled through the system as well. And then finally, real user monitoring from the real user, of course, and we'll cover that in a little bit more detail. So stepping into that, synthetic starts with some basic tenets. And I, I was gonna keep this going, but I decided not to here. But basically, synthetics is a simulation. It is an active method of defining the pathways through which your infrastructure and application flow here. And so there are a couple of things that are immediate things that are coming here. What are we simulating? Are we simulating the end user? Are we simulating just the backend functionality? Are we simulating the impact on the, the, the web itself? Where are we simulating it from? We live in a global society. So are we also looking at what could happen if you come into us from London or from Australia or from Antarctica? How do we simulate what the changes in those environments are inside of here? What metrics should be captured? What analytical pieces? So we're getting lots of data. This is the observability side of here. It's a lot of data coming in here, but it's kind of useless unless we can monitor, analyze, and respond to it here. And then why are we even doing the synthetics here? Why are we doing these things and who should be using it? So actionable metrics help you diagnose the problem, answer those questions and verify it here. And our end user pieces can be things like helping to drive sales, improve our conversions, or look at new markets. Um, and think of this in many ways like uh, what we call the mystery shoppers. So somebody has gone in, we know that they're going to be there from the back end side here, and they've tried to do a transaction. It used to be real popular when we could actually go to source uh, for this, and just seeing what the experience was like and writing it up. Synthetics fall into that same category. It's a mystery shopper. We know to expect the the transaction to come in here and we'll find out what the transaction was all about. So when we get into this, we are going to simulate everything. We're gonna simulate the protocols, the applications, the services, what the user's process was, how the user got to us and take a look at the network. And we need to be able to simulate from anywhere, every last mile, all the way up to the home, every edge, all those pieces here. We also wanna capture every single metric that looks at those things that we are, are touching inside of here. Full fidelity is a major piece of a synthetics model because we are testing. We are looking at the actual input. And therefore with this, we need to be able to look at every single piece of data that falls into a synthetics model here. And bottom line, our goal is really find the problems before our customers, our users find the problems here. And those problems could be at any of the network layers, the application layer, it could be in the cloud. Um, I, I, again, if you, if you think back a few years, we had a major re online retailer who went down because a single service that they did, didn't scale. And so while everything worked fine, they couldn't manage the inflow of data. And then this is actually useful for everybody. This, this crosses the boundaries. It's not just a DevOps or a devs environment. It's not just an operation environment, but it actually crosses into the marketing side, into the product management side, and into the leader side. When you look at this, synthetics actually gives you the ability to do all of these pieces in a test and controlled environment. And that's actually where we start really coming out the difference between these two. Rum and synthetics try to look at the same things here, but the difference is that synthetics is a controlled environment. 
and rum is the real user. What did the real user experience in going through this? And rum gets used a lots of ways, constant monitoring, to see things like when and where page load times have increased or where response times. Um, you know, the, the, there's, there are a number of studies uh, that have shown up here, but most recently Google updated their study in 2020 that shows that 3.6 seconds has an almost a 78% chance of a person leaving your page, leaving your site before whatever they're doing com completes. And at five seconds, it's all over. And at 10 seconds, they'll go on social media and complain about you. So we now start looking at those things inside of here. We can also use this to find the weird things. Testing for production is not the same as running in production. And so the intermittent stuff, those edge cases are likely to show up from a real user basis. And so we can look at login failures. By the way, you can also use that login failures if you have all the data to take a look at whether this is somebody who's forgotten their password, is it a problem with the transmission, or is it an active attempt to try to crack into your system here? RUM also really quickly shows you that your application is working correctly, that the system, the environment is all driving correctly here. And similar to what I just said here, we'll find different things that show up. Um, quite often, you'll, you'll hear someone say, oh, you know, this isn't working on Chrome. And somebody will say, oh, go try Safari, go try Edge, go try Firefox. And so we now have different platforms. We don't have this ability to test every single possibility through every single platform because users are really good at finding new ways to do things here. But real user monitoring will show you what the impact of them using that platform is. And finally, a development team can, can actually troubleshoot problems that are caused by deployment. And so we can actually narrow down the surface area of our search by using all this information. I can go from a RUM model, simple RUM filter, that says, is it in the front end? Is it in the application that sits and talks to the web browser or to the mobile device? Is it in the back end? And that is a very simple, straightforward, chop in the middle filter that gives you quickly which side the problem exists on. You can continue to expand those filters and get closer and closer. Is it networking? Is it load balancing? Is it elastic scaling? Is it ephemeral behavior? So you can quickly use RUM to narrow down a problem, especially problems that are intermittent in their own right. So RUM, Tenants, passive monitoring. Just like synthetics is active monitoring. We know it's going to occur, we fired it off. RUM allows us to do passive monitoring. Go in and look at things as they're occurring or as they have occurred without necessarily having any preconceived conditions set here. They're always transaction-based. They have a start and they have a finish so that we know when it's completed inside of here. Every single RUM monitoring transaction is unique. There are no such things are, this is identical to the other. Your times may vary, your pathways may vary, and honestly, your environments may vary underneath it here. They're always user focus. Start the monitoring at the user endpoint so that you can make sure that the user's journey is correct here. And then finally, if you're not getting all the data, you're not getting the whole picture. And keep those things in mind as you're looking at, at building your RUM environment. User focus, but full fidelity. Keep in mind that data is always important, especially when we're looking at edge conditions or intermittent conditions. And so finally, the future so dim, you gotta wear shades. I have to pick on this a little bit uh, for this, but with this quick introduction, you know, this is a way that you can start looking at how your world of monitoring is gonna change, as well as how the tools are going to help support you in the future as you start looking at this user experience. And with that, let me turn it back over to Chris Great. and we'll, we'll take it from there. Thanks, Dave. So yeah, I wanna emphasize that, that final point that, that Dave just made, which is, you know, we already know that the, the nature of our applications are changing. Some people hope that that change stops, but it's never gonna stop. <laughs> and your management plane, so how you monitor those applications also has to change because if it doesn't change, that velocity, all that automation, all that great stuff that you've done to build out an advanced delivery chain, 
is not going to sustain. And right. like I said before, you need to think about monitoring at each layer of your technical stack. If you have snowflake monitoring at each individual layer, then you've created a visibility silo. So somebody's going to be really good at monitoring one aspect of the delivery chain and not all of the others. As you move from the bottom up, you do change your persona. So as you get closer to the top, as Dave said, you do start to bring in interesting data related to marketing and, and go to market. And then at the bottom of the stack, you're more around the area of IT. But sometimes I know it feels like we just keep on throwing new monitoring terms out there. I know it can feel that way, but really what we're doing is making sure that organizations have visibility across their entire stack, full stack monitoring, and those individual layers are not information silos, which just hold, hold you back. Yeah, Some, something you just said triggered a thought in my head, and I probably should include this in discussion. If the tools you are using at each layer don't talk to each other, don't share information, don't share context, you are just quintupled or whatever times um, the workload that your team has to do to figure out what the hell is yeah. going on. Absolutely. So make sure that the, the, the environment isn't 17 discrete tools that you need to, re to repeat your forensics exercise or your monitoring exercise. Make sure that you can work from one tool to the other as well. 